Welcome to worship. It is great to be here. It is so fun to look out and see that some of you forgot where you used to sit. It's been so long. Oh, it's great to have you here. And think about who you know that you can invite to come and join you here at Mount Calvary. Summer camps are ready for you. Mount Calvary is offering in-person summer camps for our kids at Minnewashta Park, so go online and check that out. Our one-year Launch by Love campaign is off to a great start. We're just 100,000 away from our goal of 350,000, and again, that is for Senior Pastor Transition, New Technology, and Partners in Mission. Online and in-person gifts are welcomed. LSS, or Lutheran Social Service Homeless Youth Programs, are helping youth get back on track and sometimes reunited with their families. Here is our video for tonight. So hi, my name is Sean. I am the program coordinator at Resic House. The mission of Resic House is first to give youth a safe and secure place um, to, to get them off of the streets and to get them housed. And second, it's a transitional housing program, which means that during their time at Resic, they are given tools that they will need when they move out. We do independent life skills classes. So all of the things that you'll need to know when you get an apartment that you just, you never learn anywhere else. We at Resic serve youth 16 to 21. We're journey oriented. The youth picks what they want to do and how they want to do it. And we provide the tools and resources and support so they can do that. Where I work is the Resic Resource Hub. It says youth come to me and here's a particular need I have. And, and we work to see that need is fulfilled. What feels really special is when, um, if we send out a wants list and we get what's on the list, um, <laughs> is wonderful. And, and, I, and it, I do see it from the congregations and from your congregation that I say, oh, I need, um, I need cleaning supplies. I need these cleaning supplies. And those are the cleaning supplies we get. Um, it shows, again, that intentionality and that care. That people are actually thinking about who they're serving and why. And that, it, again, it's not about them. It's about the, the people they serve. And even just the small, we get small cards of thanks and things like that regularly, and that's just, it's just nice. You know what I mean? It's nice to be like, hey, I see you. Thanks for the work you do. It seems like such a small thing, but it, it really changes your day, you know? I love it. I absolutely love it. It's wonderful. It is a work of conviction. I believe that this is in some way revolutionary to do the work of empowering people and getting people to a place where they can be themselves. I have worked with youth in the past in other capacities at other places, um, both professionally and as volunteer. And I myself was homeless when I was younger. But having been through those things and seen the kinds of uh, barriers that are put up, wanting to come in now and help be that support for other people as they try to become themselves in their lives against all of the barriers that are, that are put up in our society. Well, Mount Calvary has a long history with Lutheran social services, as many of our Lutheran churches do, and you've been a part of it by being part of Mount Calvary. This May, we are doing a big spring shower, collecting household items for Resic House, Life Haven, and Safe House, all LSS youth uh, operations. And so you can go online to the outreach page and pick something from the Amazon wish list. It gets delivered to Mount Calvary and then delivered to those organizations. So it is a thrill to be part of it. And now we begin our worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's one of my favorite songs. Now it is time for our Bible story, and I am very excited. We have already lit our candle here. This is our Christ candle, and we keep it lit every weekend in Easter to remind us that Jesus is the light of the world, that no darkness, no shadow can overcome. So our candle is lit, and we begin our Bible story in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. How's everybody doing today? How about people at home? Are you thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs to the side? Halfway in between. Martha back there is thumbs up. Two thumbs up. Pastor Jose Antonio, thumbs up. All right, two thumbs up from Julie. So wonderful to be here with you today. In some ways, I know it is something we have been longing for for over a year. And so it is a true blessing to really be in each other's presence. The story for today, Jesus loved to tell stories. And so he told a story to his disciples. And it's a little bit, you have to kind of put your kids at home, you have to kind of put your thinking caps on a little bit. If you can imagine with me, can you imagine with me that Jesus is a tree? Outside you can see all the trees, they're starting to blossom and the leaves are starting to come out. And so Jesus is saying, I'm like a tree or I'm like a vine, a sturdy vine, Jesus says. And he says, and you, you are my branches. Now, I've got, I got to ask you a question, and kids at home, I want to ask you a question. Where does the fruit come from? Does the fruit come from the trunk of the tree, or does it come from the branches? Well, you know it comes from the branches. That's where the flowers grow. That's where the leaves grow. That's where the fruit comes. And that's what Jesus says. He says, I want you to go and bear good fruit. What's your favorite fruit, Marion? Grapes. Perfect illustration for today. Oh, Apples are out of season right now, but I love a good apple, the pink lady apples. Mmm, so good. What kind, of, what kind of fruits at home do you guys like? Well, Jesus says, you guys are the fruit. And when people meet you, when you are loving and you are kind and you are gracious, he's saying it's like you taste good. Mmm. And when people see you and see how loving and kind you are, they'll know me too. Now, if the fruit grows on the branches... Where did the branches get their nutrients? Where did they get, where did the branches get their food? Huh? From the trunk, from the vine. So that's what Jesus says. He says that I'm the trunk of the tree, I'm the vine, and when you're a part of me, when you're connected with me in the middle, then you will bear tasty fruit. You're going to have good fruit on your branches. And so today, it's like we get to reconnect again with Jesus, the true vine, the true trunk of the tree, where we are rooted and secure, where we get our nourishment. Amen. first lesson is from the 8th chapter of Acts, beginning with the 26th verse. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he replied, how can I unless someone guides me? and he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that was he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? 
for his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What's to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Here ends the reading of the lesson. Gospel according to John chapter 15. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated, everyone. <clears throat> Grace and peace to you, my brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus gave our ancestors, the very first followers of Jesus, a promise, a powerful promise, a world-changing promise. He said in the first chapter of Acts, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And brothers and sisters, you and I right here, and all of you at home, we are living proof that Jesus keeps his promises. Because here we are, at the ends of the known earth, following Christ, full of God's Holy Spirit. Jesus keeps his promises. 
And in the story today of Philip and the Ethiopian, Jesus is keeping his promise from the very beginning. But how is the question. How does Jesus keep his promises? The answer is through death and resurrection. When Jesus promises you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit and be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, he isn't promising continuous progress, always up and up and up. He's promising death and resurrection. That's how Jesus keeps his promises. Death and Holy Spirit resurrection. So in in order to fully understand and hear the story of Philip and the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8, we have to go all the way back to Acts chapter 6. To death part 1. When the twelve disciples die. Well, not literally, figuratively, they die. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Nathaniel, Matthew, Thomas, and all the rest, they cease to be the only official leaders of the people of God. You see, there was a problem. They, the 12 disciples, and probably the majority of the community at that time, were Hebrew-speaking. They were the Hebrew-speaking Christians, and every day... They had this ministry that they did, kind of like what we do here. They feed people. Every day they went out and they fed the hungry, the widows specifically in their community. But some widows were getting left out, specifically the Greek-speaking widows. It was already a little bit of an ethnic conflict in this little Christian community at the beginning. But they said, this cannot do. We have to do something about this. So there was a Holy Spirit resurrection, brothers and sisters. The disciples chose seven new leaders to help in serving the community. And very importantly, these were Greek-speaking leaders from a new ethnic group brought together into one because of the Holy Spirit. Death to the old community and resurrection of a new community. And God draws the circle a little wider. See, Jesus is keeping his promise. Now there's death part two. This time, somebody actually dies. Stephen, he gets stoned. Stephen was one of these new Greek-speaking leaders, one of the seven that got added to the number of apostles. And he began doing signs and wonders in the same way that Peter had been doing, in fact. He began teaching in the synagogue full of God's Holy Spirit, And he was taking that original plan of feeding people way further than anybody expected. His charisma, his storytelling, his talking about the love of Christ gets him in trouble with the religious leaders in Jerusalem. And they want to take him out, and they literally take him out. They take him out outside the walls of the city, and they stone him to death. Now this leads, in fact, to more deaths as the authorities begin hunting down Christians citywide in Jerusalem, and our ancestors, fleeing for their lives, head out of the city, and that first church dies. Becomes, the people become scattered all over Judea and Samaria. Now, I know it's not how they imagined Jesus would fulfill his promise, but off they go. Not because things were getting better, but because they were dying a little. Off they go to Judea and Samaria anyways. And that's, brothers and sisters, where we meet Philip. Not Philip the disciple. And this is something that I got confused with when I was uh, a younger. This is Philip the servant, Greek-speaking. One of the ones chosen to do the food service. He was one of the new leaders. So not Philip the Apostle, Philip the Servant. And his old life in Jerusalem dies as well as he flees to Samaria where just like Stephen before him, full of God's Holy Spirit, he begins doing signs and wonders in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And joy fills the city. A resurrection. Death and resurrection. Now, Peter and John, one of the the two apostles, the disciples of Jesus, 
they hear about this, and it, the Holy Spirit draws them. Draws them to cross the centuries-old cultural barrier and go to Samaria and pray for and even lay their hands with blessing upon the people there. People who earlier, just maybe even a few years earlier, they would have avoided at all costs. And so there is a death of an old prejudice and the birth of a whole new community in Samaria held together by God's Spirit. Death and resurrection. Now in Samaria, Jesus is keeping his promise. God is drawing that circle a little wider. Now death part three. You know it was too good to last. Death part three. Two baptisms and a funeral. Almost. Now in Samaria, Philip, remember Philip the servant, had been doing signs and wonders in the name of Jesus, like I mentioned before. Healing the sick. Casting out evil spirits. Making the lame to walk. Now, there was another wonder worker in the town, Simon the sorcerer, and he began to take notice because all the people in Samaria used to call Simon the sorcerer the greatest. And he's kind of, he doesn't like that Philip is honing in on his territory. So Simon kind of cozies up to Philip. And he's trying to figure out what's going on. So he asks to get baptized too. And this is where we get the funeral. Well, the almost funeral at least. So Peter and John are laying their hands on the new believers, praying for the Holy Spirit to come. And Simon sees this and sees the Holy Spirit poured out upon these people as they're baptized. And I don't know what this looked like. We don't know what it looked like. But it was evident to Simon the sorcerer. And he's like, I got to have this power. I, I need this for myself because I want to be able to lay my hands on whoever and have that power too. And so he gets his wallet out and he starts pulling out silver coins and he starts handing it to Peter and says, Peter, give me this power that you have. Well, Peter recoils in horror. Curses and destruction upon you and your silver, he says. You can't buy the gift of God. That's not how this works. Now, it's interesting what Simon the sorcerer does next. He, he doesn't really apologize. He kind of just says, Oh, uh, pray that I don't die, okay? So we have one baptism and the funeral, well, the almost funeral, for Simon the sorcerer. But now it's time for baptism two here at the end of our tale. So right after this, an angel whisks Philip away to the road that goes south to Gaza, which is along the seashore on the pathway to Egypt, which would lead all the way back to Ethiopia. And there's where he meets the Ethiopian court official. Now this guy is near complete opposite of Simon the sorcerer. That's why you need to hear Simon's story too, because they're contrasting stories. And they both make each other's story brighter. That's why I wanted to tell you that first story. Because the Ethiopian court official is actually a powerful and wealthy man. It's not based on kind of the flim-flam snake oil of Simon the sorcerer. It's, he's really powerful. He's in charge of the whole treasury of the queen of Ethiopia. And this Ethiopian man, unlike Simon the sorcerer, was also humble and reverent. And you know this because, for one, he's called a eunuch, which means he had suffered through castration, probably because he was in servitude to the queen. But he was also reverent towards God because we meet him now on his road home after worshiping at the temple in Jerusalem. He was a reverent man, unlike the ambitious and blasphemous Simon the showman. So when Philip meets the court official, the court official is, uh, the Ethiopian court official is sitting in his chariot reading from the prophet Isaiah. 
And he asks Philip to help him understand this passage. And this is an important point. Listen very carefully. What does this passage say? Of all the places in the Bible to choose to read, why this one? Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And upon hearing this message, the story of suffering and death, He says, who can this be about? And Philip tells him. He says, this is the story of Jesus. It's a story of one who suffered and died. It's the story of the Lamb of God who was sacrificed to take away the sins of the world. And after his humiliation and death, he rose again from the grave so that everyone might have new life through him. And it's upon hearing this story, the story of suffering and death and resurrection, that the Ethiopian court official asks to be baptized. While Philip happily does so, and the Ethiopian man goes back to his country rejoicing. The story of death and resurrection now goes to the ends of the earth just as Jesus promised and God draws that circle wider still and notice it's not through might not through power but through death and resurrection think about it just a little bit when Simon the sorcerer saw the power of God's Holy Spirit He didn't see God's love. He saw fortune and glory. He saw a commodity he could buy, that he could trade upon, that he could do some cool stuff with for himself. But when the Ethiopian official saw the story of Jesus' suffering and death, he also saw God's love and God's Holy Spirit bringing new life from death. And he witnessed a Savior who loved him, and who he could love. Death and resurrection. Resurrection and death. That's how Jesus keeps his promises. A contemporary example. A pastor I met led a Bible study with a group of women survivors of abuse and violence. And in an effort to be sensitive to the wounds of the people in her group, The pastor stuck to the more pleasant Bible readings. As many of you know, the Bible is a very rated R book, if you read all of it. And she stayed well clear in the PG sections. She didn't really want to talk about the Bible stories that talk about abuse and violence. But it was saccharine. It was meh. Something was in the way. Something was keeping the group from really connecting with God and each other. And the pastor decided, you know what, we got to just plunge into this. we got to go through the valley of the shadow of death before we can get to the table at the other side. we got to dive into these hard stories of our ancestors where women do suffer and die, often violently. So when she stopped da- dancing around the violence and death, the pastor then finally heard the stories from the hearts of her Bible study participants. One of them saying, I remember when I thought I was going to die. And one by one, each of the women spoke right from their souls. Their experiences of suffering. One by one, they finally were able to bring their true stories, their true selves, into the light of grace. Why? Well, they told the pastor why. When we heard our stories of suffering in the Bible, when we heard 
our sister's stories written there in Scripture, we knew that God knew us. And that feels like life. Death and resurrection. God is still drawing that circle wider and wider still, and Jesus is still keeping his promises. How? Through death and resurrection. We will all continue experiencing all kinds of death. Death of careers, death of businesses, death of loved ones, death of ambitions, death of self. And through the valley of the shadow of death, Brothers and sisters, through the valley of the shadow of death, Jesus promises to walk with each and every single one of you. Jesus claims you. You belong to me, he says. You are a child of God, a sheep of my flock, a sinner of my own redeeming. You belong to the people of God, and you are part of the story of God, and you make a difference in God's world. And nothing, nothing, not even death, can snatch you from my hand. Do not fear death, Jesus says, for I am the resurrection and the life, and you are mine. That is my promise to the ends of the earth. Amen.
Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born under the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We invite you to remember those, remember in prayer those members and friends who are listed in the pamphlet. Gracious God, for the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and patience may grow among nations, peoples, neighbors, and within divided families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For seasonable weather this spring, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and a subsequent bountiful harvest, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the people of India and everywhere, who are struggling against a raging pandemic and suffering, and those suffering from danger, violence, oppression, and abuse in all its forms, both physical and emotional. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the underemployed, for those left destitute, and those who yet continue to strive and struggle to make ends meet with dignity in these economic conditions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. The, the peace of Christ be with you always. Remember to share the peace with someone today. God's love is steadfast, and God's faithfulness endures from age to age. Let us confess our sin and our need for God. Let us take a moment of silence for reflection. Gracious God, you encourage us with your love, bringing new life out of death. We confess that we need your life-giving power in our lives and our relationships. We have hurt others and been hurt. We are often angry and afraid. We continue to live in ways that do not lead to peace and justice. Forgive us, O oh God. Pour your spirit of wisdom and healing upon us, that by our lives and our loving, we may glorify you through the risen Christ. Amen. Our confession is an acknowledgement of our humanity, our need for God's grace. God has promised that we are forgiven. We accept this assurance with humility and with hope of the resurrection. Amen. As we share Holy Communion, I invite you to wait to open your communion until after the Lord's Prayer. And if you are joining us in worship from home, we invite you to get a beverage and a cracker ready at this time. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood 
shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, you may get your packets ready. Body of Christ given for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace forever and always. Amen. Now receive the benediction. As Christ burst forth from the tomb, may new life burst forth from us and show itself in acts of love and healing to a hurting world. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Bless you now and forever. Amen. We invite you to stand and sing along with us this time. Good to see everybody. Go in peace. Peaceful.